Hello and welcome back to Voyage of a Time Wanderer. Today I am here to do the postscript tag for 2023. This is one of those reflective end of year tags that does a really good job of summarizing both my reading year and my year on booktube and I did it last year I think for the first time last year and it's definitely one that I would like to repeat year over year because I think it has some really interesting questions and allows me to talk about some books that uh, didn't quite make my favorites list or weren't on my favorites list for different reasons but were books that still had an impact in shaping my reading in 2023. So as far as I can tell, this tag was originally created by Adam at the channel Memento Mori back in 2018. So I'll link his original tag video below. And it's one of those tags that I see so many of my favorite booktubers doing at the end of the year. So the first question is, what is the longest book you read in 2023? And which book took you the longest to finish? So I went on Goodreads and checked my uh, page count stats and no surprise it looks like the longest book that I read in 2023 was Anna Karenina by Lev Tolstoy. This is, spoiler, also my favorite book of 2023. So it is uh, a mammoth book but I found it very well worth it. Uh, my Goodreads has it clocking in just shy of a thousand pages, like at 983 or something like that. There's actually a number of books that I read this year that were kind of in that like 600 to 900 range, but Anna Karenina comes out on top as the longest book that I read this year. It ended up taking me, I think, about a month and a half-ish listening to this on audiobook as a buddy read with my very good friend. And so even though it was such a long book, I found it to be a very enjoyable reading experience and a very impactful book. As for what book took me the longest to read, uh, just going purely off of start to end date, that would be The Real Valkyrie, The Hidden History of Viking Warrior Women by Nancy Marie Brown. This is a book that I actually started in August 2021 and finished in April 2023. So it took me quite a while to read, not because it's overly difficult or that long. I had just uh, put it aside. I had originally gotten it as uh, an e-arc from NetGalley and I didn't really love how the formatting was showing up on my phone. And so I kind of lost interest in reading it, even though Nancy Marie Brown is one of my favorite nonfiction writers and I have really enjoyed uh, numerous of her books that I have read and so I kind of put it aside uh, one day in August 2021 and forgot about it until I saw it again at my library and I picked it back up and finished it very very quickly after I picked it back up. So that is the book that technically took me the longest to finish because it took me like a year and a half. And I want to give a shout out to one of my other longest books both in terms of biggest page counts and took me the longest to read and that is The Catechism of the Catholic Church. I have been following along with a podcast for this book that is reading it uh, throughout the year. So I started this book on January 1st and I will be finishing it on December 31st. So it's going to have taken me the full year to read, reading it every single day. And so that is uh, really the book when I think back on my reading in 2023 that I was reading consistently and still took me a year to finish. The second question is a book that you read in 2023 that took you outside your comfort zone. I find the longer I am alive as a reader and also on booktube, I feel like I have a less and less clearly defined comfort zone because I have picked up so many books that I didn't originally think I would like because I saw someone that I know and trust recommending it on booktube and ended up really enjoying it. So I've really branched out in my reading tastes in the last few years. But the book that kind of came to my mind for this prompt was Letter to His Father by Franz Kafka. I feel like I see Kafka quoted almost everywhere quite a bit. Uh, and so I really wanted to try some of his writing. And so I picked up this Letter to His Father, which is exactly as it sounds. It's about uh, a 75 to 100 page-ish letter that he wrote to his father kind of chronicling his uh, childhood traumas and the issues that he had with his father and why he was uh, quasi estranged from him at this point. 
The part that made it uh, especially kind of sobering to read is uh, in doing some research about it, I found out that his mother actually confiscated the letter so his father never read it before his death. So it kind of ended up feeling a little voyeuristic knowing that I was reading such a personal letter that dealt with so many uh, deep set issues that the author had in his uh, relationship with his father and then knowing that his father never even had the chance to read this letter. And at the same time, I also found the writing style to be a little bit dense and philosophical. So I don't know if maybe that wasn't the best place to start with Kafka. If you are someone who enjoys Kafka's writing, please recommend to me uh, something else, maybe one of his fiction, uh, where else I could try starting with him. But this was definitely, even though it was quite short, something that took me outside of my comfort zone. Question three is how many books did you reread in 2023? And I went through and counted on Goodreads and I reread eight books this year. Pretty much entirely childhood or teen favorites of mine that I was feeling nostalgic for and wanted to reread. Question four is what was your favorite reread of 2023? And there are two books that I reread that I really, really loved. The first is Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. Uh, this was my third reread of Sense and Sensibility. I read it in 2016, 2019, and now in 2023. And every time that I read this book, I get something new out of it. This is one of my favorite Austen books. I've kind of almost given up on ranking Jane Austen, but I definitely have like a top three and a bottom three, and this is a top three Austen for me. This time through, I listened to it on audiobook for the first time. Uh, using the Rosamund Pike narration, which is absolutely a stunning narration. I always seem to kind of forget just how funny Austen is until I'm rereading one of her books and finding myself laughing out loud consistently throughout the reading experience. And my reread of Sense and Sensibility was no different. It also really struck me this read through how many similarities there are between Willoughby and Edward's situations throughout the book. And yet one is very much the villain and one is given a hero's treatment. Uh, you may be able to tell that Willoughby is like the one often villain that I have a soft spot for and Edward is one of my least favorite uh, Austin heroes, so I'm always a bit of a Willoughby apologist when I'm rereading Sense and Sensibility. I know that's like a controversial Austin opinion. And I was also struck by how oldest daughter syndrome coded Eleanor is, as well as just how much of this plot revolves around miscommunications and assumptions that characters are making about other characters and their situations. This is an Austin that I know I will never be sick of rereading, and so I'm sure it will show up again in a postscript tag some years in the future. And then I also reread the first Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants books by Anne Brashares. I had not read these books since I was a teenager, but they were a series that I absolutely loved, both the books and the films when I was kind of like grade 8, 9, 10-ish age. I absolutely loved the stories and these characters. I remember relating so hard to some of the emotions that the characters were having. And so it was really interesting to reread this book for the first time as an adult after having probably 15 years elapsed from the last time that I had read it and finding just how differently I view some of the characters and their feelings and actions through the lens of having some more maturity myself. Question number five is a book that you read for the first time in 2023 but you look forward to rereading at some point in the future. My answer this year is definitely Brideshead Revisited by Evelyn Waugh. This is a book that as soon as I finished reading it, I knew I would want to reread at some point in the future and also that I would get so much more out of on a reread. Throughout most of the book, I was kind of struggling to relate to the characters and I felt like it was very much uh, the author wanting to say important things versus kind of allowing the plot and characters to naturally explore those ideas. So it was kind of coasting along as like a three star read for me right up until the end when I was really blown away with the resolution of the plot and the final few chapters and epilogue really pulled it all together and I ended up giving it a four star but it's one of those books that I know on a reread I think could be a five star. I ended up putting it on my favorite shelf on Goodreads and it's like one of the only four star reads on my favorite shelf. I listened to this on audiobook and when I reread it I would really like to read it physically at kind of a slower pace and probably annotating it because 
There are a lot of themes and motifs and really beautiful prose that I would like to savor a bit more slowly and go through and highlight and really mark up a copy and I think I would get even more out of uh, the rereading experience of this book. The way the structure of this book uses time skips throughout Charles's early adulthood, but always him returning to Brideshead like an anchor point as a labyrinthal symbol of the circuitous nature of conversion is absolutely brilliant and I appreciated so much more once I had the full picture of the story in front of me. There were just so many beautiful quotes and passages in this book and it's definitely one that I don't think I could fully absorb on a first read. Question number six is a favorite single short story or novella that you read in 2023. And for this, I want to talk about Address Unknown by Catherine Cressman Taylor. This is a brilliant epistolary short story that becomes nothing short of hauntingly prophetic when you realize it was actually written and published before the Second World War. It's written as a series of letters between a Jewish art dealer living in San Francisco and his former business partner who has returned to live in Germany in the 1920s. The letters give a really unique insight into the rise of Hitler and just how quickly Nazism was able to get a grip on people living in Germany at the time. And the way the book is formatted, you see like the letterhead and the stamps and the postmarks and everything, which makes it feel very, very tangible. I was definitely surprised to find out that this was published before the Second World War because it definitely reads as if someone was looking back on kind of warning signs that were missed. But to find out that this was someone who was publishing, I believe in 1938, uh, it really uh, brought to light to me just how aware people were already of the horrors of Hitler before uh, the Second World War had even begun. It actually says on Wikipedia that this story was considered to be one of the earliest kind of exposés of the dangers of Nazism for the American public. Question seven is Mass Appeal, a book that you liked and would recommend to a wide variety of readers. And so I'm going to use this to talk about kind of the runner up to my favorites list. Obviously, all the books that made my top fiction favorites of 2023, uh, that video is going to be coming out in the next few days. Uh, obviously, I would highly recommend all of those books to all readers, but I'm going to save those books for that video and I'm going to talk about like my top runner up that almost made the list and that is The Singer's Gun by Emily St. John Mandel. I feel like her three most recent works, Station Eleven, The Glass Hotel, and Sea of Tranquility are fairly widely known, but I don't see as many people talking about her earlier works. And so I'm grateful for Katie from Books and Things for talking about her first three published novels because I would hardly have been aware of them otherwise. And so I picked up The Singer's Gun this year and if you are someone who has enjoyed Emily St. John Mandel's other works, I think you would definitely really enjoy this as well. This book had a lot of the elements that I've come to love about her writing style without any of the sci-fi aspects. So this was definitely very much just a straight literary contemporary novel. It was still written as a wonderful adventure through a time kaleidoscope where we're doing a lot of moving forwards and backwards uh, from the starting point of the novel until everything finally kind of coalesces into the final picture by the last few chapters. Pretty much all of the characters in this book are morally grey at best and downright criminal at worst, but I still ended up finding myself deeply invested in their stories and motivations. We're following a character called Anton Walker who is born into a crime family and ends up working uh, in the manufacturing of fake passports and travel documents and he really wants to break free of the life of crime that his family is enveloped in and wants to just be uh, a normal white collar worker. So we're following him throughout the book as he tries to leave this world but the events of his past uh, keep dragging him back towards his old life. Then question number eight is Specialized Appeal, a book that you liked but would be hesitant to recommend to just anyone. For this prompt, I'm going to pick two of my favorite Catholic theology books. Obviously, I thoroughly enjoyed them and these are some of my favorite books that I read this year, but I understand that it has a, a very limited audience of people that would also be interested in reading them. And so those two books are Jesus the Bridegroom, The Greatest Love Story Ever Told by Brant Petra. This is my third book by Brant Petra and I have loved every single one of his books. 
By the end of this book, I really had a much greater appreciation for the depth behind the imagery of Christ as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. And then I have also thoroughly enjoyed my Advent read this year, and that is Beholding Beauty, Mary and the Song of Songs by Gregory Cleveland. You can see both of these books actually have a ton of flags where I have marked uh, passages that I really appreciated. And this book gave me some very interesting insights into the Song of Songs, which is uh, kind of a more opaque biblical book, as well as how some of the typology and passages in Song of Songs relate to the experiences of Mary. Question number nine and the final question is to reflect on your year as a bookish content creator, goals met, good and bad memories, and some of your favorite videos. I am pretty happy with my reading year this year. I am looking like I might hit 120 books. I am at like 117-ish. I'm filming this on Saturday, December 30th, and so depending on how many books I end up finishing in the next day and a half, I am going to uh, land somewhere between 117 and 120, which is right on track uh, to be my highest year of reading ever. I made 30 YouTube videos and 7 shorts or reels. And so I'm pretty happy with my reading. I would always love to make more uh, videos here on booktube. I always aim to do like two a week and I'm not even clearly doing one a week uh, if I've only got 30 videos done. But I'm still really happy with the videos that I did make and the booktube events that I participated in this year. I really loved co-hosting two different readathons, the Montgomery May readathon in May which was focused on Montgomery and the World War November readathon in November that was focused on World War One reading. Both of those readathons uh, I was working with some incredible other booktubers as co-hosts. I read some really good books and I met some great people and gained some wonderful new subscribers. So both of those events I really loved being a part of this year on booktube. And of course probably my best memory uh, on booktube this year was getting the small booktuber shout out from a book all of that uh, resulted in gaining a ton of new subscribers and was also just really exciting to be recognized by one of my favorite booktubers. As far as which are my favorite videos that I've made this year, I think my three favorite videos that I've made this year are my uh, reviewing six different Pride and Prejudice retellings Jane Austen fan fiction video. I have been reading different Pride and Prejudice retellings for years with this video idea in mind and so it was really rewarding to finally put it all together and create that video. And I have had some people comment saying that this opened their mind up to trying uh, Jane Austen fan fiction or retellings of Jane Austen's work which I'm really excited that uh, I was able to impact people in that way because I have had some absolutely wonderful uh, experiences reading Austen retellings as well as some not so good experiences. My other favorite video is 10 ways that I read books for free. This is a video that I hope will kind of live on as evergreen content because I listed 10 different ways that I am able to read as much as I read uh, without having to spend very much money on books. And I put that video together trying to consolidate all the tips and tricks that I have come up with to be able to source books for free over the years. Uh, people have left wonderful additional recommendations and uh, website options and things in the comments and I really hope that that will be uh, a resource that people can stumble across for years to come if they are trying to read more books on a budget. And then lastly, of course, uh, another of my favorite videos that I did this year was my first ever booktube Q&A. This video was a lot more work than I at first expected it would be. It took quite a while to gather all the questions, uh, kind of track down the books that I wanted to use to answer the questions, script out my answers, and then the actual filming was hours long and it took quite a bit of time to edit that back down to anything even remotely manageable. But it was really, really fun to see what kind of questions I received as comments. And there were questions about my reading life and about books that made me consider things in a way that I'd never thought about before uh, and allowed me to talk about some books that I had never talked about on my channel before. So that was quite a bit of fun. So those are probably the three videos that I'm most proud of this year or that I look back on the most fondly. So those are my answers for the postscript tag. The tenth question is just to tag some people. If you would like to share your answers to any of these questions in the comments, I would be of course interested to hear 
uh, kind of your summary of your reading year and if you have a booktube channel and would like to make uh, your own version of the postscript tag feel more than welcome. Thanks for watching and until next time enjoy wandering through the pages of a good book. Bye!